Good morning, good afternoon. I hope uh, everybody can hear and see me. And most welcome to this uh, uh, webinar, which is organized by the Dutch Business Association in Vietnam, uh, in cooperation with our friends from the Eastern European Chamber of Commerce, the German Business Association and the Spanish Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my name is Julian Maya, and I'm very pleased to uh, be your host today um, to what I think will be a very interesting discussion about the topic of Vietnam as a China plus one mid tech destination. We have um, three gentlemen here online that will have very different backgrounds and have very different insights about this topic. Uh, I'm very happy that a big number of you have found uh, their way into this webinar. This is very important because we would like to have your questions in the chat box down at the Zoom screen. You can ask them anytime during the presentation. Just a little bit of the house rules. You see them here on screen. Um, the cameras are off, uh, you are muted, but please feel free to ask your questions in the chat. The structure of the meeting is as follows. We have reserved 45 minutes for two brief presentations. One will be given by Martin Manche, who is in the Netherlands, and who is the chief commercial officer of EWD Compass in the Netherlands. I will introduce him in a second. After that, we will have opportunities for questions and answers. So we will directly after the presentation, take your questions and have a brief discussion on that content. And then we will open a poll, which is related to our topic. And you have two minutes to do that poll for us. And we can discuss that after the next discussion, which will be given by Live Schneider, um, who is uh, giving us insights on setting up shop in Vietnam from the legal perspective. He is uh, very, savvy on the merger and acquisition side, and you will give us uh, the latest on what it means to start your business here in Vietnam, where I am. Just a very quick introduction to the topic. Uh, most of you will be aware, but China plus one basically refers to China plus Vietnam, in a lesson sense also to the other countries of Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, Myanmar, before there was some, uh, some serious disruption there, but we are basically talking about the trend that a lot of manufacturers, um, uh, companies who have a presence in China are at least deleveraging that presence and also seeking a new additional site or a move into uh, Vietnam. And I myself have a background of uh, many years in Asia. I came to uh, Hong Kong in 2003 to actually move the Hong Kong Octopus system to the Netherlands where we have the Oppo chip card system. So I, I'm very much in infrastructure and in the rail industry. I uh, landed, so to speak, in Vietnam last year as part of the pandemic. My last role in China was to introduce uh, infrastructure technology of Strukton, the, uh, the famous infrastructure and architecture company in the Netherlands. And now I, I'm here in Vietnam, very much focusing on the topic of today, which is helping foreign, but also Chinese and Vietnamese companies to have a presence in China, but also in Vietnam. Um, it's, it's a very interesting topic because it is also very much in flux. As you are aware, uh, over the last weeks, there is a lot of talk about disruptions in the supply chain. But I think today we want to have a look at the mid and long term view of Vietnam, particularly for the mid range kind of um, SME level companies. And I'm happy you're here again. So let me quickly introduce the other speakers of today. Um, first, we will uh, listen to um, some presentation of Martin Manchi, who is the chief commercial officer at EWD, a company that's based in the Netherlands. Um, he will uh, explain his background himself. He also had uh, quite some exposure to the China market and now also to Vietnam. So I think EWD Compass is a classical example of a China plus one strategy. And I think we can learn from him what it means to build a presence here in Vietnam. Life. Um, is, is an, an attorney with background in international arbitration. He has a, a already a lot of experience in, in corporate clients that are looking for mergers and acquisitions and IP matters across the whole region uh, that includes Europe, but also Asia. So I'm very happy to have you as well live. And we will see um, a splendid introduction to market entry in Vietnam. So again, um, welcome everybody. I will keep it short. Um, the time is set at 90 minutes in total, so uh, there's a lot of time for questions. So I would like basically to start with the presentation of Martin, who will 
share the screen and he will like, uh, elaborate what is the main reasons why Vietnam could be a very attractive country to, uh, to explore your China Pass 1 strategy. So Martin, the floor is yours. Uh, looking forward thank to- Thank you very much. Okay, Yuri, I'm very, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, let's see, this is it. Okay, um, my name is Martin and I'm a senior commercial officer at EWD Compass. Um, we are a, a, a service provider company uh, based in the Netherlands, but also with offices in uh, China and Ningbo area and in Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh City. Um, what we do is trade support services in um, a very broad spectrum. Um, uh, main part, the primary part is the import services. And we do this in all kinds of industries. Uh, uh, building and infrastructure is one of our main businesses. Um, also the uh, metal business is uh, something we do a lot in and also in composites, there's quite a bit of work for us. Um, what we do is <clears throat> we provide services from the sourcing end um, uh, and uh, uh, looking at uh, the, the quality of the partners that are uh, introduced. Um, uh, going into um, uh, the quality control processing uh, up to uh, support in the supply chain um, uh, all the way up to uh, bringing the product into Europe. But also on the export side, uh, we're active, um, uh, helping to find uh, distribution networks uh, or even setting up a shop in uh, specific countries. Uh, we do all this for European, Western European clients um, that are active in uh, Eastern Asia. Um, main offices, as I said, are in, uh, in China and Ningbo, um, which we do most of our uh, work and also in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Um, so our strategy is also China plus one. Sorry. Um, so in metals, you can think of uh, extrusion processes of uh, things being welded, uh, but also uh, in injection molding uh, of aluminium, uh, which is one of the things that we're really uh, good at. Um, and we um, also are able to, to get coatings that will stick for long times. So these are quite complicated processes um, that are actually doing quite well at in composites, uh, we go all the way from um, uh, glass fiber, um, uh, uh, simple molding uh, with spray up, but also extrusion processes. Um, and also in the carbon, there is um, uh, quite a market that we are active in. Uh, in glass, what we do mostly is the laminated glass, but there's also possibilities for uh, insulated glass. Um, so there's uh, quite a nice market for that as well. And, uh, we do a lot of that in China. Um, machines were active lately as well, quite a bit. Um, this is a reactor that's uh, uh, being used in um, uh, the food industry. It's um, uh, evaporating um, uh, materials in onions to uh, get a nice um, end result uh, of an, uh, an onion oil. Um, so there's many possibilities also in the food sector that we're active in. So going to the topic, um, China, of course, as you all know, is um, uh, the biggest exporter in the world and it's actually also the second largest importer in the world um, and the second economy in the world. So it's uh, for us, it's a major uh, line of business and also our main um, our priority. Um, also, if you look at the economic complexity, uh, it's uh, uh, going up and up and up. And uh, that's also part of the reason why uh, lots of people are looking at a strategy China plus one. In terms of the global markets percentage, um, some people still think of China uh, in the old production ways, but uh, at the moment, more than 20% of uh, electronic products and uh, almost 20% of machines um, in the, that are in the global market are actually exported from China. Um, so they're the, the major um, um, 
country for exports and really the, uh, the factory of the world still. In the uh, EU 15, um, the Netherlands is uh, uh, quite a, a large player. Of course, Germany is bigger in France. The United Kingdom stepped out. So right now is um, uh, getting uh, a separate uh, a structure, I think, in this, this type of um, uh, view. But uh, the Netherlands as a fourth uh, in 2019 is uh, one of the major players. And why would you go out of China then is really the question. Well, one of the main things that we see is that the labor costs are uh, really evolving. Um, you can see here from 2009 to 2018 how the labor costs are developing. And uh, if you look at the average manufacturer wage per worker on the, uh, the second part, uh, you see that uh, China is going towards uh, Taiwan. Uh, where Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, and India are still uh, above uh, the wages of Vietnam in that year. Um, so there's uh, quite some interesting part of looking at Vietnam before you can look at the other countries. Uh, uh, further shifting in goals. So if you look at the new five-year plan, uh, you can see that there is a a really big shift uh, going on. Uh, even the, the goals of developing the economy at the fast pace that we're used to uh, is not as big a goal anymore. They're uh, really shifting into people's well being, environment, uh, more green development. Uh, they also try to get rid of the more uh, chemical part or the more uh, impactful uh, parts on, on the environment. Um, so China is uh, looking to extend the business that they have and to also keep going for developing both the internal and external economies, um, but at the same time also trying to shift to a higher, uh, really high tech end of the, of the market and uh, to uh, invest really big in innovations. So shifting of those goals is uh, an important part of why many companies are also looking at the risks of their type of company becoming part of that um, uh, part that uh, the Chinese uh, government wants to um, get, uh, lower in or get rid of uh, in, the, in the long run. And then where will they go? Well, the Rabobank uh, a few years ago in 2018 decided uh, that they uh, would make uh, an overview looking at different uh, indexes. So the export similarity, uh, the institutional quality, the wages compared to each other, and ease of doing business in uh, all the different countries. Um, as you can see, the export similarity, Vietnam is at the top. Uh, if you look at wages, which is um, um, uh, an index that's turned around. So if it's a higher point, that means that the wages are more interesting. Um, uh, they're also doing quite well uh, compared to many other countries. Um, the top countries were Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam, um, uh, followed by Taiwan, uh, which are all, of course, in the ASEAN uh, district. Um, so if you would look at uh, going somewhere else, then this would be an area that most companies would go and look for. Vietnam, um, as the topic of the day, uh, as you can see, I took uh, uh, the, the picture all in orange because uh, of the situation at the moment with COVID, uh, which is, um, uh, of course, uh, giving us gray hairs also on this side. Uh, um, Vietnam is really developing. It's the 20th country on import and export in the world at the moment. And also the complexity is coming up. Um, of course, if you want to see what is going to happen in the area, you can also look at what is the market growth from a Chinese perspective. And uh, the fastest growing market in uh, uh, 2018 compared to two or 2019 compared to 2018 was the Vietnamese market, actually. So they are really looking at this market as well. But also we have to put it in perspective, because if you look at the province of Shenyang, where Ningbo office, our office is, um, uh, and you compare that uh, uh, total year of output uh, in 2019, it's still bigger than the, the Vietnamese economy. What's going really well in Vietnam is that they have a lot of trade agreements. They um, really put a lot of effort into uh, 
getting contacts, um, uh, making free trade agreements all over the place. Um, and uh, Australia, uh, Canada, uh, but also with uh, the regional uh, countries, there's really good trade agreements, which have a lot of possibilities for the European countries uh, and all the companies, uh, also the SMEs that are in our area. Um, Vietnam uh, has a good level of craftsmanship. Uh, the, the English is good enough for the technical level. Uh, it's easy to, um, to get your specifications through and to um, get it on the right topic level uh, to make sure that the, the, the quality is good. Um, so we are really positive about um, uh, the young workforce that is in the, in the country at the moment. Uh, also, they're open to quality control. There is um, some areas where it's difficult to, uh, to bring people into the next level. And um, if you can actually uh, uh, get a good process innovation uh, going and the companies are open to work with you, then the quality can really arise uh, out of that. And we have really good experience with um, uh, mid-tech uh, products in, uh, in Vietnam. So there's, there's a really positive development to be made. Um, the output as a result um, is also really good. These are, for example, uh, bumpers that are for the American market, uh, made out of glass fiber. Um, so there's lots of possibilities to, uh, to develop within the country uh, to get your specifications through and uh, to get a good output. Of course, you have to find the right partners. So the sourcing process, getting a good audits in place, making sure that you get a good quality control is really an important basis of being able to do the right business because also these kinds of situations as you see here uh, are still a part of the, the, uh, the business in Vietnam. Uh, we still see uh, people welding uh, uh, barefoot and uh, all kinds of things that are uh, not to the standard that we want it to be. Um, but you can really take uh, the right factories out of it and also help them develop the process to make sure that you get what you need. Uh, another important one is the availability of materials. There is um, um, a lot available in the market itself, but it doesn't always uh, stick to the specifications that you need yourself. Um, so there is um, lots of um, uh, imports also from the Chinese market from material that does fit um, uh, the qualifications that you need to make your product. And we see that in, in all different kinds of, uh, of materials. Um, in metals, for example, it's the sizes of, uh, of the raw materials that are usually off or also the, uh, the value, the quality of the value of the, of the materials. So there's uh, lots of um, possibilities that if you know the supply chain and you're able to source the right materials uh, from other areas, uh, that uh, this is a really good combination and you can actually develop it until uh, you get your product at the, at the right level. All of it, of course, starts with knowing your goals. Um, so if you go into the market uh, to export um, because you want to develop the market and you think it's interesting, uh, then you will have to find the right network, uh, distribution network, uh, also find the right factories. And as you know, the culture in, in Asia is uh, really knowing people. Uh, so you will need um, uh, some carriers to, to bring you into the market. Um, if you're looking to uh, set up a production, um, of course, Life will uh, talk about this further on. Uh, there is um, many possibilities as well, uh, but you really have to find uh, the, the good co-workers, the, the right people, uh, the right spots to where to develop. Um, so this is also uh, uh, very important to know what you want and how you want to set up because when you start, you also have to choose what am I going to do here and how am I going to set it up. In general, that's my uh, introduction. Um, so if there's any questions right now, then uh, please uh, come and share. Thank you, Martin. Uh, very crisp and um, uh informative uh, slides. Um, I have a couple of questions for you and I want to start a little bit uh, with a question about how you guys entered Vietnam. 
um, you are obviously not running all the factories that are relevant for you in Vietnam yourselves. But can you give us a little bit more background how you started your office in Ho Chi Minh? What was the challenges? And in particular, you know, how did you find the partners that you mentioned are very important? Uh, when we started going to uh, Vietnam, um, uh, we re really started by just going into the country. And um, Bim, uh, our uh, chairman, he uh, started by going into Vietnam, going to industrial parks, uh, visiting all kinds of people, um, uh, finding good people to, uh, to help us get carried into the market, to see what the quality level was, what the level of the people was and to see uh, uh, what the interesting um, areas and also uh, product groups were that could be made within the uh, Vietnamese market. Um, uh, challenges, of course, are um, uh, that you really have to start again uh, if you're, you have a, a settled product in, uh, in China and you want to go into the Vietnamese market, then you shouldn't expect the same outcome at, at the start of all, uh, uh, the whole ball game. Um, uh, so you really need some time to develop the product and to develop the relationships. Um, uh, all the factories we're working with are um, Vietnamese owned, they're um, the, uh, local businesses. Um, and what we do is really the trade support. So we, we find the factories, we make sure that uh, they understand what's needed. And from there, um, uh, we start our, um, um, yeah, our line of inquiries and business. Really. Excellent, uh, because as a follow-up question, you know, I have um, had the, the privilege to build factories in, in China, but also in Vietnam. You have your operations in Ho Chi Minh, but also in Ningbo. Can, can you give us a little bit of a comparison from your view, China versus Vietnam, just from the grassroots level and where you think where it's going? Um, yeah, if you look at uh, the uh, China at the moment, it's really uh, going towards, um, if you look at mid, mid level, uh, uh, mid tech production, um, they're getting more specific. So you can uh, order smaller orders at the moment uh, uh, at a bit higher price. Um, they're developing into uh, more high tech uh, in, in that area as well. Um, they um, uh, are less interested in um, uh, the more chemical products and things like that. Um, and if you look at Vietnam, uh, you get the questions there that you got many years ago in China. For example, uh, how many containers will you do? Uh, that's one of the first questions. Uh, it used to be like that in China as well. When you started, you, you, they would ask uh, big minimum order quantities. Um, and uh, China is going more towards the specifics where Vietnam right now is uh, doing more of the cereal products really. Um, and I think uh, Vietnam will develop really well in, in the near future also towards uh, the more high tech side, uh, but uh, it's, it's still in the development process. And uh, I think those productions are, uh, um, if it's low wage and there's a lot of work on it, then it's very interesting to be in Vietnam right now. Uh, I agree. Uh, you mentioned now for the second time that Vietnam has the ambition to become at least, at least mid-level, right? Not the only uh, El Chico kind of production market. Um, I think you are very right. The young generation is very ambitious. There is excellent universities in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh, even in Da Nang. So I'm with you quite optimistic that um, Vietnam will move up the value chain. Just a little bit for everybody. As um, Martin mentioned, there is a little bit of a COVID wave going on in Vietnam. It's nothing compared to what's going on in Europe um, a couple of months ago. But what you see is that the government is giving priority to the vaccines, to the production sites, not to the elderly, but to the production sites to keep them up and running. So first, the big ones, you know, for Samsung and Apple, but even the smaller ones. And the second group, particularly here in Ho Chi Minh, is ICT companies. So there was a company that was vaccinated to keep that going. So I think it's also very interesting for people on this call to look at the traditional sourcing industries that uh, Martin is in, but also look at more high tech. I think within the next five years, it could be very interesting. Um, but just a final question for me, for you, Martin. If you compare China and uh, Vietnam, 
how much is the percentage of business? Is that 50-50? And is that going to shift in either direction? Or what, 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 what's the future? Um, no, at the moment, I think uh, uh, Vietnam is about 20% of what we do. Um, and if you if you look towards the future, we do believe that uh, more of the, the mid-range products that we are making at the moment in, in China, um, many companies are interested in uh, sharing production. So looking at China for uh, uh, the smaller order quantities, the more complica- complex products, um, and looking at Vietnam for the, the bigger lines and, and making that connection of both countries. And in that way, I think it will also be a, a very interesting strategy because it's also a share of risk. Uh, and also you can put bigger orders uh, in both areas uh, and actually be in both markets if you're also interested in uh, exporting in the area or uh, even being developing uh, for the local markets. Excellent. Yeah, that is, uh, that is very informative. Um, I just want to have a call to the uh, audience if there is other questions for Martin. Um, I think you gave us some excellent insights because you are exactly at crossroads between China and Vietnam. So that is uh, great information. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Do you have any uh, questions for the audience or some uh, triggering points that we would like to discuss maybe? Yeah, I'm really interested to see um, uh, from everybody that's in the call who's right now in the Chinese market and and interested in um, uh, going into Vietnam and also getting um, uh, the the goals they have uh, going into these markets. Yeah, that's an excellent segue, Martin, into the little poll that you have prepared. Um, I will open a little poll for everybody now. Um, it is um, accessible now, um, and you will see just a few questions. We will keep that open, and you will see uh, exactly the question that Martin now asked. So are you and your company currently considering a relocation of business out of China? And then there's another question, which are your major points of interest in uh, joining today's call? Uh, that is more for us to know. So please start the polling. While I uh, again would like to thank Martin, we can take more questions in the second part of the Q&A when we have heard life's story. I think it is um, a perfect point while you're doing your uh, polls to uh, open the floor to life. He will uh, give us a different angle, basically how to set up shop in Vietnam because Vietnam is promising, but it's not uh, you know, an easy a country to just come in and do your thing. There are a lot of regulatory things to be taken into account. So live welcome to this webinar and I would like to hand over the floor to you. Share the screen and uh, off you go. Well, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I'm just trying to switch over to the shared screen for all of you. All right, um, let's start with uh, a, a short introduction. Hello, everybody, and xin chào to our uh, Vietnamese listeners. Um, my name is Leif Schneider. I've been working here as a lawyer in Vietnam in Ho Chi Minh City for about three years now. And uh, before that, I, I had uh, roles in international um, companies and law firms, uh, mostly catering to um, Vietnamese uh, investment from three years ago, and before that, international investment into the region. I have a background in arbitration and also intellectual property and uh, earned my credentials in Europe, in Germany, so I'm German qualified. Um, So let's just start with uh, a couple of remarks about uh, the firm I work for now, which is ACSG Legal. Um, It's a locally grown international law firm, um, working together with uh, a multitude of international relationships and a network catering to all foreign investment into Vietnam and uh, especially um, in uh, renewable energies lately and in corporate and M&A, which uh, covers the entirety of the industries which are currently active in Vietnam. Um, Start with the discussion. I'll give you a brief summary about uh, my uh, presentation because structure is very important and oftentimes missing in Vietnam as far as our experience goes. So the overview goes in two main parts. The first one is the general investment conditions in Vietnam, um, consisting of uh, strategic considerations, linking into what uh, 
Martin just said uh, from his reasons and other considerations to move out of China. Um, then there's market entry conditions in which I give you the legal background and, and show you the ropes about uh, what matters when you want to move in and what uh, the requirements are and how you qualify. Then we have uh, a more specific second part um, about tech investment into Vietnam, which uh, then caters to the title um, China plus one mid tech destination. Um, I'm going to make this a little bit broader um, as far as tech goes and mid tech is a little bit narrow to cover the entire spectrum, especially the very interesting industries and developments in Vietnam um, as of recent times. So the general environment and government policies with regard to tech investment, the industry specific laws and regulations, and uh, I'll add some case studies, even though we might lose those as an expense of time, because obviously you want to give room to a um, discussion. So to the general investment conditions in Vietnam. There's some strategic considerations which you need to make um, in the very beginning before you even um, start making connections and, and uh, structuring your business, which is, first of all, and this is what uh, Martin talked about a while, um, why Vietnam as your China plus one? So there's a, a multitude of different considerations um, because China, as such is becoming increasingly volatile as a product hub and trade partner. So origin starts to matter because China products are currently a little bit hard to push across borders with tariffs and trade barriers coming up. Vietnam has not experienced that yet and is politically stable enough to also promise that for a while to come at least. So this is a, a very good argument why shifting over from China and out of Vietnam, uh, out of um, China into Vietnam um, makes a lot of sense. There is, uh, as uh, Martin also expanded on, a multitude of free trade agreements, um, which uh, includes the in Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. Um, and that includes very interesting countries such as Singapore and Vietnam, which have both ratified this agreement. And we use this structure a lot for offshore holding and investment into Vietnam because there's very favorable conditions in that regard as well. So please have a look at uh, this chart, which uh, expands on FDI in um, the first couple of months of 2021. Um, we've reached nearly 14 billion USD in FDI into the country. I'll uh, give you a couple of seconds to let this chart sink in. And when we talk about uh, tech investment into Vietnam, then you also need to identify the investor first, because the identity of the investor will matter a lot to the structure of your endeavor here in Vietnam, and it will also matter to uh, the paperwork and the formalities that need to be covered. So the structure of your investment matters for the corporate governance, which includes the shareholder agreement, the charter, and also the equity you want to invest into the company in Vietnam. Location, location, as everywhere in Vietnam is also um, very different from north to south. All of these red dots indicate industrial zones in the different provinces in Vietnam. So these industrial zones offer favorable conditions um, and each to their own have uh, specific industries they cater to and capacity and also conditions. So you need to qualify and, and really look into it. I cannot really delve into any detail in, in this uh, specific realm. Putting it uh, next to the map of Vietnam, what we saw before the chart, we will um, delve into the highlighted part, which is obviously the tech and also industrial investment in Vietnam, which is a uh, almost half, 43.9% 40, uh, of the entire investment during the first five months of 2021 um, go into that part that we're talking about today. And uh, the next point is your local due diligence. Your local due diligence matters a lot um, because you need to know who you're working with and what you're doing to cover your liabilities and mitigate your risks. Um, that uh, includes Feasibility studies, is, it includes, uh, if you want to do an M&A into the country, it includes um, the due diligence for the legal and project 
Um, those are legal questions and they're very different depending on your way into the country and the structure of your investment. Your local network and resources will matter a lot because obviously everybody needs to source the staff and source materials. Um, find, as you can see on the map, prime real estate for your endeavor and also um, find the necessary experts because the industry that you're in might require special requirements. So the second point I want to make here, and this is uh, the most legal point of the entire presentation is the market entry conditions, which usually happens through company setup, partnership or M&A transactions. The investment procedure um, is structured into basically two steps. If you go through a company setup, there is uh, two certificates you need to require, which is the IRC and the ERC. IRC stands for Investment Registration Certificate and ERC stands for Enterprise Registration Certificate. This means that this two-step process is one in which you first need to register and get approval on your investment. This includes presenting a business plan and getting a, um, approval for your investment capital. Then you will, in the second step, do what every Vietnamese person who wants to set up an enterprise here does as well apply for an ERC to then set up your company. Um, this procedure can include or, or must in some cases include um, partnerships because there's legal requirements for joint ventures in some industries, very much depending on investment restrictions, which I'll come into later. Um, there is the BCC, which is business corporation contract, there's JVs, joint ventures, and of course, you need to set up local distribution networks and also logistics and find local partners for whatever industry you're trying to get into. So the investment restrictions are um, a very important point to understand. They're a little bit difficult because Vietnamese law is a little bit patchy and it is, there's a lot of movement in the last months and years, um, even in 2021. First, Vietnam in 2007 already exceeded the W2O and uh, through other FTAs also grants national treatment to uh, a number of states. National treatment in this context means that uh, a foreign investor, when he sets up shop in Vietnam, will be treated like a national, like a Vietnamese person setting up such a company. And that includes all the favorable or at least not restrictive conditions that that brings forth. Um, as I just said, there's a new investment law and new regulations. The investment law, um, 2020, um, which entered into force at the beginning of this year, 2021. And then on the back of that, implementing regulations, like especially decree number 31, 2021, which is very recent from March um, of this year, and gives guidance on the exact conditions of investment for foreigners here in Vietnam. So that also means that there is a negative list concept applied now, which is a novelty as far as investment is concerned, because usually there is a restriction of investment as far as it's not allowed under free trade agreements and Vietnamese law. Now, the new concept allows everything to be invested into across all industries unless they appear in this annex um, specified in decree number 31. Um, and if you're on that list, then certain conditions may apply. And these conditions and restrictions I have outlined here in the um, presentation as typical investment restrictions. So these might be restrictions such as requiring a joint venture partner, um, a local joint venture partner, um, minimum capital requirements, certain equity amounts that you need to bring into the company um, or deposited equity, um, local majority shareholder requirements in certain industries which are strictly regulated and usually sensitive or considered sensitive to national security or other things. And then there's other individual credentials that are needed in certain industries, such as pharmaceutical industry. You will need doctors and pharmacists in order to set up shop. The investment approval and merger control is uh, the second big branch of how to get into Vietnam and how to set up shop here. Um, this uh, means that you buy a company or you invest into a company by acquiring shares from that company. The new merger control regime took effect in May 2020, 
which means for about a year now we've been practicing underneath this. Um, there's thresholds in which then merger control applies, which means you need a, an approval for your acquisition, for your investment into an existing Vietnamese entity. These thresholds, um, I don't uh, want to bother you going through all of this, are certain capital thresholds or concentration thresholds, which then makes it necessary to approve this investment and this before you sign any agreements. There's special regulations which uh, have different thresholds for credit institutions, insurance companies, and security companies. Um, the procedure for this is, like I just said, you have to ask for permission before you enter into the transaction. The duration of these procedures is a little bit hard to predict. There's, I think, a three-month um, deadline in, in, in the regulations, however, it can take longer depending on the industry, especially also because um, the law isn't very old yet and there hasn't been much practice or precedent in practice of this law. So what we experience on our transactional daily basis are roadblocks in these things, which I'm not gonna go into too specifically right now because we are running out of time already. However, um, these roadblocks can be, for example, in a situation where you need a Vietnamese partner and you want to operate through an offshore holding structure that the Vietnamese entity will then have to register with Vietnamese authorities their investment abroad. And this is a result of foreign exchange regulations and can be a very lengthy procedure and oftentimes also scare Vietnamese partners away. As soon as you set up shop in Vietnam and uh, want to enter commercial operations, you will face practical issues. Like for example, where to get office or real estate, which uh, um, pertains to the map I've showed you before. Where do you want to be in the country? What's your preferred location? How can you get the most beneficial um, circumstances for your investment? This uh, is a picture of an industrial park in large, um, one of many, as you saw on the map before, you can see uh, these are very large areas of land dedicated to normally certain industries where they are clustered together and uh, enjoy certain investment conditions which can be favorable. So corporate governance um, is uh, a major part of the corporate um, operation part, which you will have to consider in advance and at all points of the operation of your company, because this is how your company runs and how you manage the operations. It will include the choices about legal representative, managing directors, other directors. It will include shareholder meetings. It will um, include the members council in a um, limited liability uh, company. It will include the daily business and reporting. It will also include if you want to divest, if you want to exit the market, if you want to um, onboard and get more investors in, it will also include the transfer of shares, with, uh, which can be very different depending on the kind of company structure you choose. Staffing and labor compliance um, obviously makes a lot of difference. Vietnam has a very developed labor law, which is almost comparable to some European jurisdictions that I've uh, come into touch with, and therefore really requires special attention and special legal advice from local experts. Vietnamese labor law um, does also apply to foreign employees, which means that um, certain um, things need to be considered when getting people into the country and when hiring foreign people to um, fill positions in your Vietnamese company. Banking, accounting, auditing, everything that has to do with money is a little bit of a difficulty in Vietnam, usually especially because of very strict foreign exchange regulations, which are monitored by the State Bank of Vietnam, SBV and uh, it can be a real difficulty getting money out of the country in is normally not a problem, but especially for investment capital and revenues, the expatriation of these funds can be quite tricky. We come now to the second and more specific part of this presentation, which is the tech investment into Vietnam, in which certain conditions apply, which are a little bit more favorable than the general conditions, which are general environment and government policies Low, mid, and high tech. Now, mid tech is a term which is not clearly defined and also unknown to Vietnamese law. There's no explicit guidance on mid tech. However, there is on high tech. Like for example, in decision number 38 of 2020 by the prime minister, 
um, there is a clear incentive to further and promote high tech um, uh, industry in Vietnam. So these investment incentives apply mostly to promoted industries, which are on the plan of Vietnam and on the way from Vietnam of wanting to become an industrialized nation. And these get published in decisions by government um, bodies, which basically outline and plan the decisions for the next up to 30 or even 40 years and ask local governance then to comply with this and implement on a local level, which is also why these uh, conditions can vary from region to region, from industrial park to industrial park. Industry specific laws and regulations um, are especially then in the investment restrictions in certain industries, it's very industry specific, so I cannot go into much detail here. Um, the political incentives that I just talked about from the Politburo and from the prime minister's office, they link into that. And uh, I've quoted uh, one here in, in its uh, whole beauty. Um, I'm not gonna read it out to you. Um, these implementations, like I said, happen on a regional level and need to be coordinated with local authorities. So it's very important to have experienced local council to do that for you. All right, almost at the end of this. So I'll give you a very brief uh, run through my case studies, which are um, basically three cases, um, if you count that as one. Um, Pegatron and Foxconn very recently invested a lot of money into Vietnam. Um, and uh, they will do so over the next years because this kind of investment always um, obviously follows a cascade of other investments. So these two are very new in Vietnam. However, there's also um, particularly German companies that have been here and uh, developed a really big footprint over the last even 30 or 40 years. Um, at least since 2007, since Bosch established a wholly owned subsidiary here, obviously under different uh, regulations and conditions, they've, they have been expanding their business ever since. Another one is ThyssenKrupp. Um, they've discovered Vietnam as a very interesting destination for the production of cement. And uh, it is indeed a very big market, um, which we all um, participate in um, transactions and also the sale of products for the, uh, the production of cement. Again, here about the company, um, we are very happy to facilitate your business here in Vietnam and I uh, invite you to reach out at any time if you have any questions after the seminar or obviously ask your questions right now. Please get in touch. Thank you, Life. Uh, excellent uh, introduction and very comprehensive. Um, I have a couple of questions for you that came in. Um, yes. Before the meeting already, and some online. So let me put those to you. It's it looks like there is um, sort of a time machine in terms of what we saw in China. Let's say ten years ago is now also here. So very similar rules, white lists, black lists, and investment conditions. <clears throat> there is a question though. Um, how would you compare the investment climate at this point of time? I will give an example. When I started a factory making trains for metro systems in China, there was an enormous uh, willingness of the local government to put forward subsidies, cash on the table. Um, so how would you compare the level of maturity of Vietnam? So how friendly are the local governments in Vietnam in your experience to welcome new investors? I would say in general, very friendly. So this is a, it, it's a, it's an encouraging relationship that needs to be built upon though. It's a, it's a thing, thing that develops between the people who go there regularly, who regularly deal with authorities. And then obviously cash on the table is not the Vietnamese way of doing it. There's just not enough cash in the hands who want to spend it. Um, so um, it's more about incentives in tax. It's an, an, about incentive in, in land rent reduction. It's about saving costs, it's about um, reducing import tariffs and, and uh, um, making it easier to set up your, your facility here by making it easy to import technology and not making you pay extra if you make it equity in your company. So um, there's a lot of money to be saved once you've committed. However, you do not get paid to come here. Clear, clear, clear. So yeah, I think that's a very good point you're making life. I think they have to understand that Vietnam is not a rich country yet. 
So they will not be able, you know, to give you cash on the table like China does. But I, I think there's a lot of tax breaks and, and helpful officials. A follow-up question on that is, uh, when I help the Chinese company move their PPE, their personal protective equipment, factory from Shenzhen to move too close to Ho Chi Minh, we really had to spend a lot of time finding the right location uh, for several reasons. Um, one region was more sensitive to environmental impacts. Another one had an excellent logistics to the harbor in Fengtao. So how would you say, because you showed this very uh, dense chart of Vietnam, which region is, is the best for what kind of industry? There is a, a difference between North and South, right? There is a difference between North and South, not only culturally and, and uh, as far as the climate is concerned. Um, it's mostly a split though between North, north and South with the center in up uh, North in Hanoi in Haiphong with a, a big uh, um, port um, and down here in Saigon, which is supposed to be the business center an economical hub um, with uh, much more modern industries and more bending um, towards uh, innovative investment. Whereas uh, in Hanoi is a lot of trading companies, a lot of logistics, and obviously um, heavier industry clustering around the, the uh, capital, obviously. Excellent. So um, on that point, you just mentioned two German companies, Porsche and ThyssenKrupp, yes. uh, your clients who have made enormous investments. I, I notice as a mentor to students from RMIT, a very successful uh, Australian University that many, many want to work for Bosch. So that's a huge employer in uh, Ho Chi Minh. What kind of industries do you see in your client base, particularly coming to Vietnam? So what is, what is the, the industries that, that choose Vietnam? And where do you see sort of the, the white spots that we could jump in? Where's the opportunities in your opinion? That's a very interesting question because Vietnam as such is a country of opportunity. Um, um, there's a lot of sectors which are currently underdeveloped or undeveloped. So there's a lot of pioneer earnings to be made everywhere. However, it's also hard work, both on the operational and on the legal side, um, which is where I normally do the heavy lifting together with my team. Um, a lot of things that we do have never been done before, not in the scale that we're doing it, not with the investment capital amount that we're doing it. Um, some of the licenses that we acquire for our clients have not been obtained by these companies before. So it's, it's a struggle and there's uh, very little room for guarantees. So um, you, you do need a very uh, entrepreneurial mindset and also you know, some cash to spend in order to, to uh, make up for any glitches or delays that there might be plenty of, depending on the kind of project here in Vietnam. Okay, so we need to have a certain resilience and flexibility to, uh, to work in Vietnam. I, I can fully... Uh... And the right that one. I mean, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's a developing country and it's a rapidly developing economy and a lot of things are happening here. Um, so to name a couple, just to uh, back, go back to your question, because I, I think I only answered half of it. A couple of the industries uh, here um, that are very interesting right now are all the infrastructural industries with uh, real estate. However, that's a little bit restrictive for foreigners because obviously land use in socialist countries um, is a little bit restrictive. Um, so um, Apart from that, obviously renewable energies because there's a lot of natural resources here like wind and solar. We have a lot of sunshine here, which now gets harnessed by a lot of especially rooftop solar. Um, we have FinTech and we have a lot of e-commerce. I mean, even more accelerated by the recent developments with uh, even Vietnam seeing a lockdown now. Um, so um, these industries are the ones that I currently advise on the most. However, I am also always surprised as opposed to other jurisdictions where I have worked before in about the variety of different things and, and also the pace and, and the creativity of the ideas um, coming into the country. Interesting. Yeah. So, so that is a, a good point for a follow up question life. You are a lawyer, you see your clients coming and hopefully happily leaving your office, uh, having a very successful investment in Vietnam. But if you could name sort of a top three kind of pitfalls, particularly in Vietnam, for your clients that we should avoid, what would that be? 
Yeah, um, obviously I haven't been to my own office in a while myself because of the lockdown order or the social distancing that we're currently undergoing. However, when uh, clients leave my uh, office happily, I, I've usually answered a couple of questions. The most commonly asked question is um, about minimum investment capital. Um, so uh, that is something that I highlighted as a, a base consideration, a strategic considerations part. Um, it's very important to have a good idea of how much money you will require and how much money makes sense and how much money will the authorities require you um, to bring in because there is no in most industries which are not restricted minimum capital requirement you have to though make it plausible and that interlinks with your business plan that you will present to the authorities and then you will bring in an appropriate amount of money so this is uh, one core consideration another one is obviously um the timeline, um, especially international clients, MNCs, stock listed companies, they're very, very wary about how, how long things will take and how transparent they will be um, with the procedure and also later the reporting standards and other things. So um, appeasing these worries and making sure there's a certain level of compliance and the predictability in what we do um, is a second big issue. And then obviously on the operation side, which is less something that I'm concerned with because that's after my clients have left the, the office very happily. Um, there is a lot of intransparency going on uh, also in, in the daily operations in how to source um, staff, how to then get the right licenses and maintain them. And we have a lot of problems with people skipping jobs in Vietnam because with a rapid development and people earning more money and a rising middle class income, these people change jobs a lot because they cannot get promoted fast enough. So um, these are probably the three core issues that spring to mind. Yeah, especially the last point about the human resources it sounds very much like China 10 years ago. You know, you came back from TET or Chinese New Year and half has left <laughs> and you could look for new people. Yeah, um, well, in, gen in general, I haven't said much about China because obviously you're, you and Martin are the experts in that regard, and I was trying to fill in the Vietnamese side. However, I, I do believe from my work that I've done in China, in Hong Kong, and also uh, in, in transactional things in, uh, in Shanghai and other places, um, Vietnam is going through all the same stages as uh, China is. Vietnam is also following some Chinese ideas. Um, I think Vietnam is very smart in learning from the right moves in the political way and uh, it's making up ground. It's going through these stages quicker than China was 20 years ago. Yes, I think that is a, a very good observation. So a final question uh, I, I get here, and it's, it's one I think it's very interesting. Imagine the new prime minister of Vietnam would be joining this webinar. Um, what would be the top three requests you would like to have for the Vietnamese government to make your life easier? All right, now this is a very interesting question, which obviously I haven't thought about much because advocacy is usually um, um, done by the uh, DBAV and other organizations. Um, however, obviously we feed into that and we also um, contribute to the um, uh, chapter groups and other things. Um, I think in order to, and this links into your last question, um, in order to really encourage people to, to come here and, and, and sleep well um, at night, we need the, the predictability and transparency. And transparency. Vietnam it has been a very stable partner, um, a very stable hub on, of investment over the last one or two decades. Uh, it's politically stable, economic growth is uh, perpetual. However, um, everybody who has done business or tried to do business in Vietnam will tell you the same stories. And I think these are the stories that we need to work on. Right um, um, now, in, as of the latest, I think we also need to um, uh, reconsider um, our stance on using foreign employers here, foreign staff, because the Vietnamese authorities have now started really implementing the laws that have already been in place um, for a long time, which are very similar to, and this is my perspective, to the European laws. If uh, you want to come in as a non-European citizen, you have to fill certain qualifications and. And these are really monitored now, and we're in a status where we're a little bit in limbo about some people who have been here for a long time and are now not getting um, their work permits prolonged. So um, I think there's a lot of advocacy going on in that respect as well. Um, and I think on top of that also for foreign companies, and this is something I only touched on before, um, foreign exchange and cross-border transactions as far as money goes is always a thing. 
um, financing becomes difficult when you have to license and register every transaction that goes out or into the country whenever foreign currency is involved. Um, and, and that is also a major road, roadblock and also a deterrent for some of our clients to go that way. Very interesting. And again, it looks like uh, copy paste what, what happened in China and still happening in China. So uh, yes, so I will go forward those uh, remarks to the, uh, the office of the prime minister and hope that he responds. I, I think the work permit thing is a huge issue, uh, even for the big manufacturers. So thank you live for, for these uh, excellent elaborations. We can take more questions actually starting now, but I first would like to share with everybody the result of the poll that we just did. Thank you everybody for uh, participating. You can see the poll if you push the polls button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I would like this uh, as the, the, the platform, as the starting point of a quick discussion between Martin, Life, and myself, and hopefully also you in the audience. So I think we see the first question is, it's, it's about less than one third of our guests today have plans to relocate to Vietnam. I think it's a little bit of a leading question because relocate doesn't mean that we want to shut down. Um, but there is quite some substantial uh, interest. So about one third of people are interested to explore Vietnam. So I think that is work to be done for people like us. I think it's a very interesting uh, result of the poll. Another thing you see is um, the reason for attending. Well, I think uh, life you uh, satisfied uh, almost 70% of people wish to hear more about the investment environment and the re regulatory um, glitches that you, uh, the hoops you need to jump. I think your information and we will share it with uh, people. This, this webinar, by the way, will be recorded and put on YouTube so you can rewatch it. Um, so I think we are spot on in terms of uh, the content. Um, now, just uh, to start the discussion a little bit um, with you free, with the three of us, um, I have been uh, living and working in China for 12 years. I'm a, a greenhorn here in Vietnam with less than two years. And the thing that um, I like most here in Vietnam is that Vietnam is actually the best of both worlds. And I mean that Vietnam has a lot of communalities with China in terms of rules, regulations, culture. But what I really like about the workforce, but also the mindset of the younger people here, mostly Gen Z people, is that they are also very much looking to the West and very much to America. So while China, China is very closed, literally, uh, also in terms of the internet, Vietnam is very open. You have very lively discussions. Um, so people here are at crossroads. So can you, each of you, give uh, the, uh, the audience today a little bit of more flavor, how you work with Vietnamese people, young people, and how you would express that in terms of, um, you know, your, your experience for now in the future. Obviously, they are all looking for promotions within a month. <laughs> we heard it from life, and we heard from my team that they are very dynamic, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about that because you are right, without the proper people, it won't work. Martin. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yerian. <clears throat> um, I think there there is a, a big dynamic uh, within um, uh, the the people at the moment in uh, in Vietnam. They're uh, really looking forward to developing. They um, uh, young people um, are interle internationally really uh, aware of what's happening in in other areas. They're really looking to. Um, expand business to um, develop to innovate um, so the, those are all um, really good uh, basic skills to uh, to go into the world with um, of course the uh, the culture is still also an asian culture uh, so there is still the, the need to know each other to find a network to get a good relation um, uh, but it's it's uh, open enough and uh, well enough established to to be able to um, get a good connection and to um, uh, develop your uh, your relationships uh, with the young people. Um, and yes, in HR, that also means that um, uh, after a certain period, uh, you might have to develop a new relation. But uh, usually, when you expand within a business uh, and so not one contact person but a group of people that you are working with then uh, there is enough stability to uh, to really get things going 
Excellent. Um, that, that triggers a follow-up question. Um, Life, you are in law and mergers and acquisitions. Can you find good lawyers here in Ho Chi Minh? Yes, and also outside of ACSV legal. Um, however, obviously, we work together with all of them. Um, as I said before, we have a good network of local and uh, also international uh, council um, here in Vietnam and in the uh, surrounding countries, which makes our life a lot easier because uh, we trust these people and we work together with them very regularly and very well. Um, if you're talking about locally qualified lawyers, which obviously I depend on and uh, which I work with the most, my team consists of these people and they're um, very highly qualified. And what I love about working with them, they're very eager to rub shoulders with international lawyers and to learn standards and to accelerate their career and, and have their eyes basically everywhere. Um, so um, much like Martin, I, I really enjoy engaging with them and we learn from each other. And I, um, there's not a week in which I do not undergo some very humbling experiences with how qualified and how savvy these people are. Yeah, that's a very good remark. So I think for everybody to know, uh, there is a large investment in Vietnam in the educational sector. Um, that is actually not investment from China. Uh, that is mostly coming from Japan, Korea, but also UK has a huge campus in Hanoi. Uh, the Australians have RMIT here in Saigon and the Americans have Fulbright. So they are uh, throwing millions into Vietnam to, uh, to build fantastic workforce. So I, I can totally underwrite this. Um, so human resources we have, it's also a very young population, right? So China is aging. I think Vietnam will too, but is, is still better placed than China. The next thing you mentioned life, you know, uh, regulatory and also integrity, you know, that is, that is an issue. I think that's a maturity issue in Southeast Asia and in Vietnam. Another thing is infrastructure. Um, as I told in the beginning, I did a, a study here in Vietnam for my bosses in the Netherlands, how the situation is, for instance, in public transport. I'm not sure people know, but there is a, a train line that the French built with a narrow gauge from Ho Chi Minh to Hanoi, it takes about four days. We are waiting for years now in Ho Chi Minh for the first metro line to complete. What would you say in terms of infrastructure, in terms of hard stuff, but also soft stuff, is missing or needs to come soon to make Vietnam really up to speed? Because that is obviously a challenge. Is that for me, yes? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, well, as, as you just said, the, the railways um, are underdeveloped. Um, uh, currently, we're waiting um, the Ho Chi Minh uh, Railway, and I'm following every movement of the trains which are being brought here from Japan. <laughs> They're closing all the streets and I hope that uh, soon we'll be able to onboard these, obviously, but not uh, during social distancing times. Um, uh, no, that is obviously everything that happens on the roads um, because of the big lorries and, 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 and proper streets for transportation. I mean, as far as industrial zones go, most, normally they're pretty well tied in because they're also outside of the city centers and they're close to ports and other infrastructural points and airports. But I think logistics struggles, and, and that means every means of transportation. Um, we need uh, more airports, we need more ports, we need more industrial zones, we need more land um, allocated to the uh, purposes of our investing clients. And uh, I think in all of these things, however, a foreign investment is a driving factor. So you can earn money by building your own infrastructure. That is very true, and um, uh, I think Vietnam has a lot of uh, good business partners in the World Bank, in Europe, but also in Singapore and Japan, who are helping Ho Chi Minh to build a whole new satellite city, you know, smart cities. It's a good business also for Dutch and European companies. I would definitely encourage people who are in building infrastructure, rail, building ports. Uh, there is some companies here who are very successful if you have the patience to really invest in time and also money and relationships to make that happen. So I think infrastructure is important because we don't wanna see Ho Chi Minh become Jakarta, <laughs> where you take three hours to get to the airport. So I think, um, yeah, that is, that is very well remarked. Uh, Martin, would you like to chip in on this one? 
Yeah, also the infrastructure on uh, materials. Um, so um, uh, what basic materials there are available uh, in the market and how these connect to uh, what's needed for, uh, for the export markets. Um, also that kind of infrastructure, there are still some possibilities to really develop uh, to become more high end also in the, on the raw material side. Um, so yeah, there is, there is still possibilities also there for um, uh, maybe even foreign investment to uh, help bring a, a higher turnaround on, on the materials needed. Uh, for example, uh, resin is something being used in lots of uh, plastic products, uh, but the high quality resins really uh, are always brought in from abroad at the moment. Um, so there is there's still lots of possibilities uh, on, on major infrastructure to develop. Thank you, Martin. I think it's really true. And uh, I think uh, we should also mention that a lot of raw materials are still coming from China. Um, that is, I think about 70, 80% is still coming from China. So there is not much generic raw material production here. And I think partially is a good thing because Vietnam has no taste to become the dump store of dirty industries from other countries, including China. Uh, what others should also be aware is that the Chinese are still one of the biggest investors here, but they have to stay a little bit under the radar because of cultural sensitivities. <laughs> we just got a batch of Chinese vaccines, but I'm sure the Vietnamese are not lining up to take those. But the Chinese are very important for raw materials and the supply chain. Um, to our previous point uh, live uh, to the workforce, we have a follow-up question from Mr. Arjan Kuslach, uh, who is uh, in education in Netherlands. I know him, and he has a question about the workforce. So if you hire people, mostly young graduates, um, what is usually you know, the, the competencies that you need to train them first most? Um, I, I, from my personal point of view, they have skills, but what is the, the thing that they need to learn most when they start working with you? All right, sorry, I had to hit the mute button first. Um, um, now, obviously I'm a lawyer in this country, which means I do not normally go much into factories and, and offices and talk to the young workforce. However, from my personal experiences with this, um, I can say that they're very well-trained as far as their skill set goes. Um, but as I mentioned at the introduction of my speech before, structure is something that is missing here. So um, they're very um, able to um, do what you tell them. Um, however, they need to be very closely supervised. Um, you, technically, they're, they're very savvy and they're very um, well-trained. However, if you give them responsibility to um, structure their own work day and their own assignments and their own schedules and deadlines, then it can get a little bit out of hand. Now, this is obviously not something I deal with a lot because lawyers are by nature um, creatures of deadlines and structure. Um, however, I know that my clients do deal with that a lot. Okay, interesting perspective. Um, maybe a question we got also for Martin. We, we saw a picture, um, this very convoluted picture with all those free trade agreements. And Vietnam somehow has wriggled itself into each and every of those. Um, the last one was the European one, the one with Europe, and everybody is very upbeat about it. But what is your expectation about the, the actual value of it? Because paper is patient. And what we have seen in China is that, you know, WTO is a nice example. There's rules, but <laughs> to really actually get the full benefit of those agreements, it takes quite a while. What is both of you the idea that Vietnam will live up to the promises that there will be no tariffs? And it will be very easy to, to enter the market. What, what is your experience from the ground? Is it easy? Do you expect improvements? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, we, we see already that, uh, that some of the, the companies that were producing in China are uh, shifting some of their products uh, to, to the Vietnam area. Um, it's not only because of the, the tariff difference, but also uh, as Life earlier introduced, uh, China uh, has his, uh, his balances in the, in the world trade uh, to defend this position, but also um, uh, get stuck in some of those uh, in, in the, the, the swamp of international trade, of course. And with Vietnam uh, being a hub, uh, 
towards all of the area, both local uh, and international. Um, there are intercontinental really. Uh, there is a lot of possibilities uh, to, to develop a business there. So, uh, yes, we, we do see already that, that people are looking towards Vietnam more um, than uh, they, they have been in the past. Excellent. Uh, Life, would you like to chip in on this one? But from the legal side, you mean? Yes, to what extent these trade agreements are actually enforceable for your client? Yeah, yeah. Well, what I know, and this is again an advocacy issue that uh, the DBAV and Eurocham and other people take care of us, um, uh, take, take care of in our name and on our behalf. Um, there is a lot of things going on and a lot of communication going on on that level. Um, I know um, a lot of people who have been very personally engaged over the last decade to get, for example, the EVFTA, the European Free Trade Agreement, across the line. Um, this is very recent. I think it was ratified in August last year and is currently still experiencing some wobbly starts because obviously local um, authorities need to learn these standards and implement them. Um, and um, it's not only a matter of law, it's also a matter of implementation and management and governance. Um, with other free trade agreements that are more Asian and uh, um, uh, a little bit more mature, we are already using them a lot, especially for investment structures. Um, it is already, and that's what you asked about, uh, very easy to in make investment, direct investment under some of these um, uh, uh, free trade agreements, depending on where you're from. That's why I said before, we, we use the Vietnam-Singapore structure a lot because, for example, the CTP, uh, CTP is uh, one very, very useful tool to get into the country without facing any restrictions or hardly any restrictions. Yes, uh, I, I think that is, uh, that is true. So I personally think that, you know, um, we need to uh, help, to put it uh, diplomatically, uh, Vietnam to understand that Europe is a fantastic very large trading partner. I think everybody is aware that Europe is becoming very strong in terms of regulations, not only in terms of consumers, but is trend setting in terms of environmental, even internet rules, e-commerce, you know, uh, while Silicon Valley was sort of the free ride of the century. I think Europe now is the leader in terms of rules and regulations based maybe a post COVID world. So I think uh, as Europeans, we have a, a guidance role here. There's an interesting follow-up question for you, Martin, I think. When I um, started new businesses in China in the last years, the government always was interested, not so much in the money, but also in the intellectual property and also in the opportunity of doing research and development. So they didn't want to do the shoe factory or just a repetitive thing that you can do anywhere. So R&D now is sort of uh, entry ticket to China. You have to bring it in sort of to, uh, to do this. The question we got here from uh, Arjan Kuslav is, when it comes to R&D, does this take place in Vietnam already? Or is it mostly, you know, here is the drawing, make it, this is the formulation, just make it happen at a low cost. So where are we and where, where is this going to move? Um, it depends really on the, on the, the, the company, of course, that's uh, uh, wanting to produce or wanting to develop or wanting to sell in the local markets. Um, if, you, if you're interested in local markets, um, uh, then the main thing, of course, will also be to customize your product to the, uh, the needs in the local markets. Uh, and then uh, R&D is, is for certain a possibility uh, on, the, on the Asian front. Um, we also see that um, uh, many companies, um, if they want to um, uh, really produce something new in the, the European environment, that they have uh, lots of uh, rules and regulations to, to uh, set by. Um, and also the development uh, is usually not as fast in the European setting as it is in the Asian setting. So we, we do see a lot of R&D uh, being moved towards uh, mostly China and in some cases also some in, in Vietnam, uh, if it's more for local markets. Interesting, um, because what I see in the ICT world is for instance here in Ho Chi Minh that there is similar developments like in the Philippines. Many people might know that the Philippines with India is the biggest call center of the world. 
that is a little bit coming here in Ho Chi Minh because there's more and more speakers of foreign languages. And I will give you a very uh, funny example. I met a young Vietnamese person. The Vietnamese are very eager to learn languages, I found out. And this gentleman uh, just through YouTube managed to be fluent in Norwegian. <laughs> and now he is the offshore CFO of this company, which is a huge parking management company in Oslo, the capital of Norway. And he is managing a team here, but also in Norway. And I think that is a very interesting thing. So he is basically also picking up the, the designs that they want to have, for instance, for a new system, you know, a new parking system, and it's being developed here. So I met a couple of uh, really smart cookies here coming from those top universities. On the other hand, I think it's also good for the people in education on this call, I know they are here, that countries like Germany, Poland, UK, and the US, of course, are very much um, desired by young Vietnamese. They are saving money and they are willing to come to Europe already now because uh, COVID seems to be under control. And funny enough, I, I learned about a lot of Vietnamese young people that are going to Finland for architecture, which is also a very big business here in Ho Chi Minh. Architecture firms doing industrial design for the whole region. So I really would encourage everybody here to get in touch with us or with other channels we can help you at DBAV if you have these kind of ideas. So I think the time is really ready to start your R&D in this country, not only because it's cheap, but because we have fantastically proactive and uh, dynamic people. This is actually the reason I'm here, uh, other than the climate, of course, uh, but to work here in Vietnam makes you feel young and energized. And these people really um, keep you uh, on your toes. So I think the question is a good one. Um, we now have um, opportunity for a last question. We are almost uh, we are eight minutes away from our uh, deadline. Um, there is a question that says, uh, it's coming from uh, Callum Davidson, with the caution around Chinese technology, how is Vietnam positioning itself to expand its skills in the technology sector? So I have to interpret this question a little bit, um, but in general, um, how would you say is Vietnam positioning itself in this mid-tech to high-tech world? What, what, where is it? And is it sort of independent from China? Or is it still sort of a, you know, a child of China in that sense? Let me just uh, do some entering remarks to respond to that question, which obviously uh, you, you, you chose a cheeky way to, to word it. Uh, <laughs> Um, Vietnam will never admit to any dependency of or from China and has always done its own thing. And that is true. It's not just a, a, a stunt. It's not just propaganda. Um, Vietnam is now, with regard to the tech segment, really trying to position itself as an alternative, not only to China, but to all of the tech, tech investment uh, environments around it. And uh, it's doing a good job by pushing policies, um, publicizing these things early to build confidence and to really like string this in um, within all of the other things that are happening here and also feeding it with the infrastructure projects that these uh, locations and projects need. Excellent. Yes, I think that uh, that is uh, very true. Uh, Martin? Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, uh, if I look into the, the the developments that we see, for example, in um, uh, carbon fiber uh, products, um, um, there are really big production for uh, uh, car factories in uh, in Germany um, are being done here. Um, also, there's good relations uh, with Japanese and Korean um, um, uh, businesses uh, um, investing into the Vietnamese area. Um, so, um, yeah, there is for certain there is an um, uh, uh, independent position uh, if you look at uh, how they are doing um, compared to the Chinese market. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. Well, um, then I basically would like to uh, wrap up. Um, I think we had a very interesting uh, one and a half hours. I think the conclusion is that Vietnam is a vibrant place. Um, it will overcome the COVID challenge. We have a fantastic workforce. But we also have a little bit of challenge in terms of bureaucracy, I think, uh, flexibility of the government. Um, it's a little bit, you know, up and down. So I think that's a question of uh, maturity life, what you mentioned, you know, you have to be resilient and uh, uh, 
you know, not easily stressed out to come here, but I think if you have a long-term plan here, I think you can be very successful. Um, I think we also mentioned that China and Vietnam are not really symbiotic, but still connected to each other in terms of the supply chain and also technology transfer. But I think Vietnam is really ready, uh, also in my personal opinion, to really step out of the shadows. I always wonder why Vietnam is sort of still under the radar. Because if you ask your friends in Europe and the US, then it's still the Vietnam, Vietnam war that people you know, think of when it's talking about Vietnam. So I always say Vietnam should step out in the limelight now. Um, firstly, because they did a good job with COVID. I hope they will finish the job as well. But also because they have a fantastic uh, opportunity to be a very singular, unique country in terms of doing business. So I would like to uh, thank everybody for joining. We have recorded this meeting. If you have questions, please send them to DBAV. Uh, the email is in the invitation. And um, yeah, thank you for joining and I uh, hope to see you in our next meeting. To so see the email addresses of our speakers today, feel free to uh, contact us uh, directly or the DBAV or your own Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam. So um, we hope to see you uh, next time. Um, we will have a uh, next topic very soon, working with the other chambers. Stay well, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you, Lise. Thank you for having yeah, us. Good day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.